and right now here on BBC One Wales, the news with Darren Jordan. America turns on China in a new war of words over the spy plane. The Pentagon claims it has evidence of aggressive flying by Chinese pilots. The government admits it's struggling to meet its targets for foot and mouth. And the win against Liverpool brings Leeds a step closer to Champions League football. Good evening. Two days after China released the crew of the American spy plane, Washington has launched its strongest attack so far on the Chinese version of events. The American Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, accused the Chinese fighter pilot of aggressive flying and putting the lives of the spy plane's crew at risk. In a detailed Pentagon briefing, Mr. Rumsfeld produced dramatic video footage, which he said proved that Chinese pilots had been buzzing U.S. planes for months. A-119 or two. The Pentagon says this grainy video shot from a U.S. spy plane three months ago is proof of Chinese aggression. The tape was shown at the Pentagon by Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, chief hawk of the Bush administration. You can see how close it was. And you can see the angle of attack on the fighter aircraft. In the last few months, he said, Get Chinese military pilots have carried out 44 such aggressive interceptions. That's too close. I agree. No yeah, problem. He's very, very oh, close. Oh, yes. He's, he's almost uh, probably 20 feet from our wingtip. So he's inside of our wingtip. The implication that this was a tragic accident waiting to happen and that the mid-air collision on the 1st of April was caused by the Chinese jet. Why did the Chinese pilot act so aggressively? Uh, it is clear that the pilot intended to harass the crew. It was not the first time. Just two days after saying it was very sorry about the incident, the United States is trying to seize the moral high ground, saying it was in the right and it wants its plane back. The EP-3 aircraft is United States property. It, it, it was worth in excess of $80 million. That subject will be a, a front and center at the April 18th meetings, just as it has been every single day uh, since the uh, crew landed in China. And whether or not this crew returns to reconnaissance duties, the U.S. government says it will continue its surveillance flights off the Chinese coast. Philippa Thomas, BBC News, Washington. And Philippa Thomas is in our Washington studio. Uh, Philippa, this seems like a complete turnaround in the language being used by the Americans. How significant is this? I think it's very significant. And I think, Darren, it's partly because the crew is back home safe in the United States. And also that the government has now heard the crew's version of events. So we are hearing a new tough line from across the American government. And not just Mr Rumsfeld. In the last few minutes, we've also heard from the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, saying that the world shouldn't be fooled by Chinese propaganda. So a very tough line indeed. And Philippa, what does this tell us about how the Americans might play their hand at next week's crucial high-level meeting with the Chinese? Well, we know it's going to be a very awkward meeting now. It was meant to smooth over the tensions after the release of the detainees. But uh, now with America adopting a more hard-line stance, I think this is going to be a problem because Beijing will feel it's lost face. And I think there could be quite a lot of anger expressed behind closed doors. And with all the issues like um, arms to Taiwan, arms sales to Taiwan, for example, and future reconnaissance flights, I think there is the potential for another flare-up in the future. OK, Philippa, thank you. The Ministry of Agriculture has admitted the slaughter of livestock to try to stop foot and mouth is not happening fast enough. It says although animals with the disease are being culled within 24 hours, almost a third of those on neighbouring farms are being left alive too long. Tonight, there are 29 new confirmed cases of foot and mouth, including a second in Northern Ireland, bringing the total across Britain to 1,289. This is Samuel Chestnut's herd. Animal husbandry now means making sure pollution from the rotting cattle doesn't seep out. The animals have been dead for four days, killed because his holding borders an infected farm. He fears their blood could reach a nearby stream. He says the authorities don't have the equipment to bury them, so he offered to do it himself. I have offered my services two days ago to Math. I have equipment 
excavators that I can make available and I've suggested that they use burial sites where possible on farm burial sites where proper environmental control. Vets too are unhappy at the disease control centre in Newcastle. They told the agriculture minister Joyce Quinn that her department was actually holding up the slaughter of animals. We can't have us saying we need a decision, we need a decision and then mm -hmm. for, for, say yes we've got to get a, a government decision on that and then wait for four or five days. Any delay leaves room for the disease to spread, and the latest figures show the government isn't keeping up. Since the outbreak began, just over one million animals have been slaughtered. 541,000 condemned animals are still alive, and 400,000 of the dead ones still await disposal. Killing and burying our livestock has now become the biggest peacetime logistical task ever undertaken by the government and army, but it's not yet enough. Current policy is to cull livestock in farms next to an infected premises within two days. This crucial disease control measure is frequently not achieved. We set ourselves a target of 48 hours to take out the animals on the contiguous premises and it is this target that we're finding it harder to meet because of the sheer volume of work. We're getting there in 70% of the cases or thereabouts but there is still much more work that needs to be done. Actually the situation is getting worse not better. We've called for some stringent action previously, the army to be take over control of the field operation from the moment of nomination to disposal. That hasn't happened. The figures for new cases do suggest the spread of the virus might be slowing, and a report by leading scientists today backs the government's intentions while urging them to provide enough resources to carry them out. So the government have admitted that the policy made here is unable to cope with the reality on many farms. They just can't meet their own targets on slaughter and disposal. But the scientists are warning that effective early culling is still the only way to eradicate this disease. Tom Heap, BBC News, at the Ministry of Agriculture. The Agriculture Minister, Nick Brown, has launched an urgent investigation into an incident caught on video showing a slaughterman apparently trying to kill sheep inhumanely. The footage was shot by a resident in a Monmouthshire village. It shows a man firing at a herd of sheep and then chasing the animal to finish the cull. You may find these pictures upsetting. This is the amateur video footage now being carefully scrutinised by the Ministry of Agriculture. It shows a licensed slaughterman shooting stray sheep yeah. in the open using a rifle. But his methods prove disturbing to those watching on. Yeah, like he can't even get a bloody good kill. At one point, the slaughterman appears to have shot an animal without killing it. He then wrestles it to the ground before eventually putting a bullet into its head. All this in full view of one villager who filmed the scene from her home. Nobody had come and pre-warned us that they were going to do it. I mean, I think if they had, I would have much preferred not to have been here because what we saw was so distressing. According to strict government regulations on the humane culling of livestock, rifles should only be used as a last resort. Even then, these sheep should have been herded into a pen or held between bales of hay before being shot at close quarters. The National Farmers Union described the culling of these sheep as cruel and unacceptable. To have used them like some target practice or out of some cowboy film, hardly, you know, it's hardly creditable in this day and age. For villagers like Irene Smith, it may have been an appalling scene to witness. This is acknowledged by Monmouthshire County Council, but the authorities defended the slaughterman's actions. I think with the benefit of hindsight, I'm sure we could have done all sorts of things. I think under the circumstances and the pressures those people were working under, I think they did the best they could do on that occasion. Animal welfare during the foot and mouth crisis continues to be a major concern, especially the thousands of sheep left to die in muddy fields because of strict movement regulations. Today, the RSPCA welcomed moves to prioritise slaughter for those worst affected. John McIntyre, BBC News. At the start of a crucial weekend for the tourist industry, some hoteliers say that while bookings are severely down, the situation is not as bad as they first feared. But many popular locations, such as the Lake District, have not seen the normal number of visitors. Traffic on major routes was heavy, but there were few major hold-ups. Some of the busiest scenes were at the airports, with a record one and a half million people opting to spend Easter abroad. Excessive workload is now the most common cause of teachers leaving the profession, according to a survey for the National Union of Teachers. The union, which has begun its annual conference in Cardiff, said many teachers regularly work a 56-hour week. This weekend, the union will make its case for a 35-hour week in England and Wales. 
As the NUT conference opened this evening, all three main teachers unions looked set for a unique joint campaign in support of a 35-hour week. Today, an independently commissioned Mori poll suggested 60% of teachers in England and Wales now work at least 56 hours a week. The NUT says that's excessive and point to the recent agreement for a 35-hour week in Scotland. For us, the agreement in Scotland uh, gives us a model. The teachers in Scotland have negotiated an agreement with the government and the employers that there should be an overall limit to working time of 35 hours a week. And we think what's good enough in Scotland is you know, good enough for Wales and for England. Scottish schools begin the 35-hour week from September. The head of this Glasgow school believes the new pay and conditions deal in Scotland could entice teachers to move from England. Given the overall uh, conditions of service and given that salaries are going to rise by 20 plus percent over the next two years, I wouldn't be in the slightest bit surprised if the colleagues from England were looking for opportunities in Scotland. The Education Secretary, David Blunkett, will be speaking here tomorrow morning, but he's unlikely to offer any concessions on a 35-hour working week. Mike Baker, BBC News, Cardiff. Police are to maintain a curfew on the streets of Cincinnati for the fourth night in a row after some of America's worst race riots in recent years. Last night, officers arrested more than 150 people for breaking the curfew. The riots were sparked by the shooting of an unarmed black teenager by a white policeman almost a week ago. The Pope has led the traditional Good Friday services at the Colosseum in Rome. It was the first time that the Pope, who's 80, chose not to walk around the inside of the ancient stadium as part of the Easter celebrations. Thousands of Catholics gathered outside to, to join him in the Via Crucis ceremony, which remembers Christ's arrest, trial and crucifixion. Football and Leeds United are now favourites to finish third in the Premiership after beating rivals Liverpool 2-1 at Anfield this afternoon. A place in the top three will guarantee them a spot in next season's European Champions League. A poignant start to proceedings at Anfield as Rio Ferdinand laid a wreath in front of the cop and then the ground stood in silent tributes both for the victims of Hillsborough 12 years ago and the horribly similar disaster in South Africa just two days ago. A match of vibrancy and verve was needed to lift hearts and two teams battling for Champions League qualification duly delivered it though Liverpool initially played over obliging hosts. Rio Ferdinand, the grateful guest. The home side might have equalised almost immediately, but Nigel Martin stretched just far enough. And anyway, it would have done scant justice to Leeds' midfield authority. That was further rewarded before half-time. Though it was due to Stephen Gerrard's carelessness, Harry Kuehl's speed of thought and deftness of touch, and ultimately Lee Bowyer's inspired run and deserving slice of luck. Liverpool came back strongly in the second half with Michael Owen's cross virtually inviting Gerrard to score. But the England midfielder's joy and Liverpool's hope was extinguished soon after when he was harshly sent off. For now, it's Leeds who occupy the third Champions League place. Liverpool may have to be content with another UEFA Cup adventure via the FA Cup final. Kevin Geary, BBC News. Now, a reminder of the main news stories tonight. Just two days after the release of the crew of the American spy plane, Washington has strongly attacked China's version of events. It accused the Chinese pilot involved in the mid-air collision of aggressive flying and putting American lives at risk. Well, that's the latest. There'll be news throughout the night and all over the bank holiday weekend on BBC News 24. But from us, good night.